talk to you guys about the uniqueness and permissivism debate. So basically what I want to do in this talk, oh, there are handouts. I don't know if anyone came in late, um, or not late, but later than the handouts were passed out. Uh, there's also, if you go on the app, I think there's like this fancy way to like access the handout through the app, pretty, pretty legit. So you can do that too. Um, so like I said, I want to talk about the uniqueness permissivism debate. And basically what I want to do today is defend a version of permissivism that I think is kind of a relatively stronger version of permissivism. So what the uniqueness thesis says on your handout is basically uh, a universal claim that necessarily for every body of evidence E in proposition P, there's one unique rational doxastic attitude any agent with E ought to take towards P. And permissivism, um, I take to be an existential claim that's basically the denial of uniqueness. And they, permissivism basically says sometimes there are body of evidences, there are bodies of evidence that permit more than one unique rational doxastic attitude. So I want to start off by dis distinguishing a couple different kinds of permissivism. The first distinction um, is creedal permissivism versus belief permissivism. So um, creedal permissivism says a body of evidence permits more than one rational credence. Belief permissivism says a body of evidence permits more than one rational belief. And I'm going to kind of set creedal permissivism aside for the purpose of this talk and focus on belief permissivism. So people interested in belief uh, generally think there are three belief-like attitudes you can take towards a particular proposition. You can believe it, you can withhold belief, or you can disbelieve it or believe it's negation. Um, so this kind of enables us to distinguish two kinds of belief permissivism, kind of honing in on the, the belief side of things. One is a more moderate version that says um, a body of evidence can permit two belief attitudes, and then a more extreme version that says a body of evidence can permit all three attitudes. And so I'm just going to call those moderate and extreme belief permissivism. And then a final distinction I wanted to talk about is the distinction between interpersonal permissivism and intrapersonal permissivism. Um, and I put, in my notes, I put like technical definitions, but I just want to give you guys basically an intuitive gloss. Interpersonal permissivism is permissivism that kind of involves two or more agents, whereas intrapersonal permissivism concerns only one agent. So an interpersonal permissivist might say, you know, me and Max, we share evidence, and he can believe P, and I can withhold on P, and we can both be rational. And kind of like Miriam Schoenfield has a view like this, like based on the basis of kind of di having different epistemic standards. That's what would justify something like this. But then intrapersonal permissivism says me, Liz, a single agent, uh, given a body of evidence, given my evidence doesn't change, I can rationally hold more than one doxastic attitude towards a particular proposition. So intrapersonal permissivism is just focusing on one single agent. So in this talk, what I want to do is try to defend intrapersonal belief permissivism, or what I'll be calling IBP. And that's basically the following thesis on your handout. Possibly for some proposition P, some body of evidence E, and some agent A, there's more than one rational belief-like attitude A can adopt towards P with respect to what her evidence determines or kind of given her evidence. And I think this is a stronger notion than uh, most others have defended in the literature, partially because it's intrapersonal permissivism, partially because it's about beliefs. Uh, I don't know if it's like logically stronger, but I just don't think it's like a super popular view. Um, <laughs> so some of my arguments are going to be just for the moderate version of permissivism, and some will ex support extreme permissivism. But I'm going to be happy if you walk out of here just convinced of the moderate version. So great. OK, that's the basic setup. Um, now I'm on section two. I think there might still be some handouts at the front for those of you guys still walking in. Um, so basically what I want to do, sorry, before I dive into section two in this talk, is uh, uh, consider and address two objections to intrapersonal belief permissivism and then give two positive arguments for it. All right, so the first objection um, some of you in this literature might be familiar with is the toggling objection. And Roger White advances this objection, among others. Basically the idea is this. If a body of evidence permits more than one attitude, what prevents a rational agent from kind of randomly moving between the permitted attitudes? Uh, it seems weird to just believe P and then withhold and kind of move around without your evidence changing at all. But can a permissivist explain why this seems irrational? So that's kind of the challenge for the permissivist. And 
My response is basically this. Um, this is only a problem for the most extreme versions of permissivism. So when you think about what the uniqueness thesis is saying, uniqueness entails that there is a function whose only input is a body of evidence, and that function spits out a single rational belief attitude. Sorry, this is like belief uniqueness, right? And I think you can deny this claim in a way that's consistent with IDP, but totally rules out the permissibility of toggling. So here's how. I want to distinguish between two kinds of IDP. The first is synchronic IDP, and the second is diachronic IDP. So proponents of synchronic IDP will say, basically, at a time, two doxastic attitudes can be live for an agent, such that an agent can believe or withhold at a single time, or maybe disbelieve and withhold, or maybe all three, but it's at, at the same time. Whereas diachronic IDP says, over time, without a change in evidence, it can be rational for an agent to hold more than one belief-like attitude. But it's not at all saying that at a time, kind of two rational attitudes are live for an agent. Um, so basically what I want to do is I don't want to take a stand on synchronic IDP. I don't want to commit to whether that's true or not. I just want to commit to diachronic IDP. And I want to suggest, I guess, in my positive arguments, some changes that might be plausible that could happen um, that would allow an agent over time to move from one rational <coughs> belief attitude to another without his or her evidence changing. So in a way, I just wanted to consider the toggling objection to kind of like give you guys that distinction. But because uh, I do think a lot of good objections to toggling have been like presumed in the literature. But I think that's like an important distinction. And one thing like we can learn from this is actually that White's toggling objection. I, so I think IDP is like a pretty like extreme view, and like White's toggling objection like doesn't even apply to certain versions of IDP. It only applies to these like super extreme permissivism versions of permissivism. So I think that's kind of interesting. Okay, cool. So that's the first objection. Um, the second objection is the arbitrariness or like rationality truth connection objection. I think these are related in certain ways. Um, uh, I'm giving the version of the paper that I give Max and stuff, but I think for f in the future I might want to distinguish these better. So just a <laughs> heads up. But I did have these as one objection. So um, the thought here is if permissivism is true, then having one belief rather than another seems arbitrary. Or relatedly, permissivists seem to be giving up this important connection between truth and rationality. And so I think there's kind of two ways that permissivists can go to sort of defend themselves against this objection. Um, the first is sort of denying or pulling apart the rationality truth connection. And um, one thought, almost everyone besides like Williamson <laughs> thinks that rationality isn't factive and that rationality and truth come apart. Rationality seems to be more about responding to evidence, including misleading evidence, in an appropriate way than always or almost always tracking the truth. And some in the permissivism literature have pointed out basically, look, a body of evidence might just not always make the truth obvious, such that agents are required to respond in a particular way. Um, Miriam Schoenfield says, look, uh, at least with respect to the arbitrariness thing, agents in permissive cases can give the normal kind of defense of their beliefs. They can give evidence and arguments for their beliefs, and in a sense, their beliefs aren't arbitrary, at least from their perspective. Um, and then with respect to kind of the rationality truth objection, uh, connection thing, Meacham says, is that how you say his name? Me I think him, I don't know. Um, yeah. Truth isn't our only goal, but we care about other things rather than truth. We care about responding to evidence, including misleading evidence appropriately, avoiding Dutch books, and that kind of thing. Um, and then finally, just a final thought on this point, arbitrariness, at least in some sense, isn't a problem for merely permissivists. The fact that you have one body of evidence rather than another is mostly arbitrary, but almost everyone in this debate agrees that evidence is one of the major players that kind of determines um, which attitude you have to have. Okay. So that's the first sort of response. The second response is to kind of maintain or at least like more closely connect truth and rationality. And I think you can do this in a way that's consistent with permissivism. So versions of moderate permissivism seem to be able to maintain a, clo a closer connection between truth and rationality. So like if P, maybe um, you can believe P and withhold, but at least like usually believing not P is impermissible. I think it's not right to say like always believing not P is impermissible because evidence is misleading, right? <laughs> Um, you know, that, the, so again, the rationality truth connection can only be so close to be plausible, unless you're Williamson. Um, but that's just kind of one way you could go. That's a more moderate version of permissivism. 
You could also, I said I was setting credences aside, but get a similar picture with cred like creedal permissivism. So if P, then like usually low credences in P are not permitted, that kind of thing. Okay, final point, permissivism is an existential claim, right? So another thing that permissivists could say is, look, permissive cases are just rare. Um, they don't happen very often, so there is a close connection between truth and rationality. And whatever the uniqueness person is saying about that connection, the permissivists can say too, because permissive cases just don't happen very much. Okay, sweet. So that is my main responses to some of the objections. And now what I want to do, section three on the other side of your handout, is go over two positive arguments um, for IDP. Okay, the first is from epistemic supererogation. So supererogation, I think, is much more common and familiar to us uh, when thought about in the moral domain. And these are basically acts that kind of go in, above and beyond our moral duties. For example, like giving 90% of your money to charity or like running to a building to save, a burning building to save someone, that kind of thing. Um, and they have been applied, the idea of supererogation has been applied in the epistemic domain. I cited some people on your handout, um, but not super broadly. But um, the idea is that if you think, at least people in the epistemic supererogation are thinking that uh, literature, are thinking that epistemic supererogation is roughly something like this. These are states or actions that are epistemically rational, but not epistemically required. So in the literature on epistemic supererogation, there's two kinds, those that involve changes to your evidence and those that don't. Um, and I guess like the ones that involve changes to your evidence are like you're researching like nominalism versus Platonism and you've read like 20 articles and you read like five more before making a decision because you're just like that good. Um, but I want to set those aside because permissivism debate is like holding your body of evidence fixed. So those won't be like as interesting for our purposes. So um, the first premise in this argument is that there are cases of epistemic supererogation that do not involve changes to one's evidence. Oh, and a second thing to note here I think at least some epistemologists, I don't know how common this view is, but some epistemologists think that um, the norms that govern uh, evidence gathering are not epistemic norms. They're like practical or prudential or maybe even moral, I don't know. Um, and so if you're going out and like gathering evidence, that's not gonna be like an epistemic thing, that's like a practical thing. Um, so if you buy that view, you're gonna think that the most clear cases of epistemic supererogation are gonna be those that don't involve evidence change. Okay, so I wanna give you guys a couple cases that I think support premise 3.1. And these are actually, neither of these cases are mine. Um, the first is mentioned by Tidman and Hedberg. So I have a quote from Tidman here. And this kind of involves critically reflecting on one's evidence. So Tidman says, we do not have the duty to critically reflect on the vast number of ordinary beliefs we pick up throughout the day without even noticing. For example, beliefs about breakfast or passersby. I may think I saw an acquaintance earlier in the day. Were I to reflect carefully on the matter, I might notice some dissimilarities that would lead me to withhold belief. Or I might recall that my friend had told me he would be out of town on the day in question. The issue, however, never comes up. Suppose moments after seeing this person, I'm distracted by an automobile accident that occurs nearby. I never subsequently consider whether the person I saw was who I thought it was. I have no reason to even think about this question. Have I, by not reflecting on a perfectly unremarkable belief failed in an epistemic duty? I think not. Since we do not have a duty to reflect on the most ordinary of our beliefs, it is entirely possible for beliefs like this one to pass by unnoticed without thereby having failed in one's epistemic duties. It is neither realistic nor reasonable to insist that one must always critically reflect on the most ordinary of one's beliefs. So the idea here is that um, you can, in some cases, not critically reflect on your evidence in certain ways, be totally rational, but if you had reflected more, come to believe something else, and that's like epistemically supererogatory. So let me give you a second example, and this is from um, Duvin. So basically, Duvin's case involves getting a flash of insight that better explains your evidence, kind of like an inference to the best explanation kind of thing. So the setup for this case is you're a juror, juror on a trial, and you're trying to figure out if Smith is guilty, and um, suppose you thought about it for a while, you've like been mulling through the evidence for a few days, and then you include, you conclude by inference to the best explanation that Smith is guilty. But then, in a sudden flash of insight, you see how the evidence is actually better explained by the hypothesis that Jones, Smith's butler, committed the crime. And you change your mind about Smith's guilt accordingly. 
The important point to note is this. Once you've thought of the better explanation for the evidence, you no longer believe that Smith committed the crime, but you might have missed this explanation without in any way failing to meet any standard of rationality. Rationality doesn't require brilliant insights. And had you missed it, you could have rationally believed in Smith's guilt on the basis of the very same evidence on which you now believe in his innocence. Um, and I think Juven thinks we actually kind of reason this way and kind of inference the best explanation way pretty frequently. And this kind of thing, because it generalizes to IDE cases more broadly, is actually like a kind of common phenomenon. Um, there's some worries here I think Max is going to bring up. So I'm going to just like skip the objection response there also for time. OK. Um, so the second premise in this argument, I hope I have like motivated 3.1 by giving you guys some hopefully plausible examples. And then the second premise basically says, look, if there are cases of epistemic supererogation that do not involve changes to one's evidence, then IBP is true. And I think this is motivated the, by the idea that I think it's pretty plausible rationality is a satisficing rather than a maximizing norm. Um, being <coughs> rational doesn't require us like maximizing epistemic goods or putting all of our resources into making sure our beliefs are true or accurate or based on our evidence. And the agents in the cases I've given you are perfectly rational in having certain beliefs, but their situation is such that there are other beliefs inconsistent with the first set that kind of go above and beyond what epistemic rationality requires. And I think one worry here, and it's like kind of a general thing that is weird in the epistemic permissivism uniqueness debate is just like what kind of notion of rationality we're working with. And I think a lot of people are sort of uh, not like being silent on this or not really talking about it a lot. And I just want to say like one thing about it. Uh, it might not convince some of you, especially if you're a big fan of uniqueness. But I want to say like the notion of rationality at play at least can't be too idealized. And I think defenders of uniqueness want to try to make it like a higher standard. Uh, but I want to say it can't be too high, and here's why. You might not find this convincing, but I'm working on this part. So uh, the thought is, I think one reason a lot of people originally got interested in the permissivism uniqueness debate is because it bears on other interesting things in epistemology, like how we should respond to disagreement, right? But if our notion of rationality is this like super idealized one that only applies to like these like maximally like rational agents that like know all logical truths and like don't make mistakes ever, then I guess it's unclear how it's gonna apply to like real life cases, like how we should respond to disagreement and that sort of thing. So I think I wanna like caution people wanting to sort of over idealize the notion of rationality to think about why are we interested in this debate in the first place. Um, again, that might not satisfy everyone, especially uniqueness people, but I just want to say that. Okay. <laughs> so um, basically, the idea that I hope to have at least convinced you is semi-plausible is that sometimes there's more than one rational response to a body of evidence, the permitted one and the supererogatory one. And if that's right, then I think IBP follows. Okay. 420, so I have like two minutes. Okay. <laughs> Try not to go too. Okay. Be fast. So the second argument that I want to give, now we're on section four, is an argument from doubt. And basically what I want to argue here all the interesting work is kind of in the first premise of my argument in this one, so focus on 4.1. Um, what I would argue here is that there are cases where one rationally believes P, one comes to doubt that P without a change in one's evidence, and then one comes to rationally withhold belief that P. And so the general structure of these cases is going to look something like this. At T1, S believes P. S knows, maybe in the back of her mind, that not P is possible, but this possibility isn't really salient for us. It's not something S is... Um, you know, considering at the moment, but at T2, something happens that makes S begin to take this possibility more seriously. This can, but need not be a change in stakes. And then S comes to doubt P. If the possibility of not P is salient enough, S can come to rationally withhold belief that P at T3. And S does not need to gain, I want to I wanna try to argue, S doesn't need to gain or lose any evidence in this, in this process for this to happen. So, um, also, these are probably going to be cases where S's initial belief, she's not like extremely confident or like really, really firmly committed. So probably like your basic mathematical beliefs, not the best candidate. Um, <laughs> but so I guess I have kind of two cases in mind here to support 4.1. And the first is pragmatic encroachment. So um, at the beginning of the pragmatic encroachment debate, a lot of people were thinking about knowledge. But I think more people have been thinking about kind of pragmatic encroachment on epistemically justified or epistemically rational belief lately. So I want to think about that version um, and suggest, so pragmatic encroachment is basically this idea that what, what is epistemically rational for an agent to believe can vary based on what's at stake. 
And if you buy into pragmatic encroachment, then a change in stakes without a change in evidence can affect what it is epistemically rational for one to believe. Um, and I have a quick example of this. So suppose I have moderately good evidence that the sandwich in my fridge is made with almond butter. My roommate made it, and she just always makes almond butter sandwiches for some reason. And it seems rational for me to believe this and even assert it to you if you come over and you're hungry and you ask for a snack. But if I find out you're like deathly allergic to peanut butter and it's going to like send you to the hospital or like kill you or something awful, um, and I know there's some small chance that my roommate might have made it with peanut butter instead of almond butter, it seems like I should like withhold belief uh, that it's made with almond butter, even though I don't lo lose or gain the evidence that bears on this point. Okay, so pragmatic encroachment, super controversial. I'm actually arguing against it on Saturday, uh, 9 a.m. You guys come to my talk. Cool. Well, we'll have a there. Um, so anyway, I don't want this argument to depend on pragmatic encroachment, but if you are already sympathetic, you might, that might give you kind of a reason to believe this premise, but I want to kind of focus on another way you might defend it, and that has to do with priming and salience. So the case here is basically a case where one kind of takes time to think through alternative possibilities, one is primed with a particular possibility, or for some reason, uh, this extra possibility is made salient. Um, so I have two quick examples. I know I'm pretty much out of time. The first, like, let's say you parked, uh, I don't know, where do you guys park? In the parking lot? or the parking garage, <laughs> um, you believe your car's in the parking garage at this hotel, but let's say like, I'm really good, I'm really convincing, I'm like a politician or whatever, and I like prime you with the fact, look, like it could have been stolen, someone could have moved it, you know, someone could have broken in, people like do that all the time in Chicago, um, and I point out to you, you know, you don't really know it hasn't been, um, and I just kind of prime you with this possibility. Uh, the idea is that I'm not supposed to give you any new evidence, so sorry if I did that when I was being dramatic for a second, um, but this might cause you to doubt enough that withholding is rational for you. Um, second example that I like better, so consider a student in your introduction to philosophy class. Your student has seen the matrix and she comes to class believing, not currently, that it's possible that all her external world beliefs are false. Before coming to class, she rationally believes she has hands. She might sit through class and not gain any new evidence that bears on the question of like whether she has hands or whether she's a brain or that. But at the end of class, rationally with whole belief she has hands because she's been effectively primed with your amazing teaching of skepticism. <laughs> so um, that's the thought that sometimes priming can cause you to doubt enough that withholding is rational for you without a change in evidence. So I'm running out of time. Basically, look, if you can rationally believe and rationally withhold without a change in your evidence, IDP is true, so IDP is true. So basically, concluding, I want to suggest there seem to be strong reasons to think that not only that permissivism is true, but that a pretty strong version of permissivism is true. Thank you. Um, if I, can people see me? I can sit because if I unplug my laptop, its battery is now at this state of life and it might just shut up. I'm um, sure you've all been there. I think, I think it's because they've released enough new models of this that like, the bug has told it it's not supposed to work, I'll just buy a new one. Um, okay, so um, this paper, uh, as we've seen, presents a variety of arguments uh, for epistemic permissivism, two responses to objections, and two positive arguments in favor of the view. Uh, so permissivism is the view uh, that given a set of evidence, more than one creedal or doxastic response is rationally permissible. And I think, I think it's still true to say that permissivism is still widely considered to be a fairly controversial position, uh, and it's a break from a kind of evidentialist uh, orthodoxy that I think most people in Amherst school... Was that um, You're wrong. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just got water. Oh, Crap. Um, not doing well. Uh, you're good. So in, in many ways, like, I'm, a, I'm a really bad person to offer a critique of a paper defending permissivism because uh, I'm an epistemic pragmatist, which is an even more orthodox view, and at least some versions of epistemic pragmatism entail versions of epistemic permissivism. So, my plan is as follows. I'm first going to suggest uh, two ways that Liz's defenses of permissivism can actually be made stronger. Uh, and then I'm going to present my worries that her positive arguments actually only defend uh, a kind of weaker version of permissivism than one that might be plausible. Um, so first, uh, Liz responds to the worry that permissivism, or it's the first one I'm going to talk about, the worry that permissivism detaches rational constraints on belief from truth in an objectionable manner. I can't remember what this was in the handout, but uh, was it... Rationally uh, truth connection. Yeah, so two teeth. Yeah. Um, so the thought is that we care about having rational beliefs, 
uh, because we care about getting at the truth. Uh, but that if non-evidential considerations can affect the rationality of belief, then the rationality-truth connection seems to be broken. And so uh, Liz responds to this objection by arguing two, two things. One is to say, oh, we can break it to some extent, and the other one is to say, oh, actually, the permissivist doesn't have to break the connection. Um, but I think there's a sort of stronger response is available, because I think it's just obvious that the goal of rational belief is something over and above truth simplicity. Like, I don't know why anyone thinks that. <laughs> uh, like, first of all, there, there just is no rational pressure to believe all truths. Uh, there's a multitude of truths concerning this pairwise spatial relationship of objects in this room that I could acquire just by like uh, focusing on my visual field right now. Um, I can form like an infinity of true beliefs just by adding disjuncts to the, the propositions that I know to be true. There are loads of ways of getting true beliefs, which there's no rational pressure to do. Uh, and that's because the goal of belief isn't true. The goal of belief is significant truth. And the significance of a particular truth is a function of one's other beliefs and possibly of one's epistemic interests. So you know, you find out more things than you realize, oh, this thing is significant, right? So that means that the significance, uh, a truth that was not formally significant to you uh, can become so as the other items in your belief set or your interest set change. Um, and furthermore, even, even this claim, the claim that belief aims at truth, even if it's significant truth, that is underspecified because it could be that we aim to have as many true beliefs as possible or as few false beliefs as possible. And these goals would legislate totally opposite dogmatic strategies. To fulfill the first, one should aim to have to believe as many propositions as possible, because that maximizes your chance of having lots of true beliefs. To, to achieve the second, you should aim to believe as few propositions as possible, because that minimizes your chance of believing falsely. So clearly, these are both legitimate goals. I think it's also kind of clear that rationality, as such, can't legislate a unique balance between them. So most plausibly, our investigatory goal is going to determine how we should balance the aim of truth and falsehood. And again, that is another case where something that is not a change in your evidence, a change in your epistemic goals. Or you said standards, but this might be broader than standards. I think that's a version of standards, actually. Okay, yeah. 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 Um, so this is another way of, of th these are both cases where things that are not changes in your evidence set can very clearly uh, change what is rational to believe, um, given a correct specification of the goals of belief. So it's not detaching uh, rationality from the goals of belief. The people were just unclear about what the goals of belief are. Mm -hmm. Okay, so second, uh, Liz responds to White's toggling objection by distinguishing between synchronic and diachronic permissivism. Um, so only the former would permit an agent to change doxastic states at will, apparently. And I, I'm, not sure, it, I'm not really clear on this, because diachronic permissivism doesn't tell us what has to change for our rational permissions to change. It just says that the time has mm -hmm. to change, but like the time could change without anything else changing. And so you'd still be toggling, right? Because the relevant, nothing relevantly interesting has changed except time. So I don't think that's, you know, that's the yeah. right way to spell out uh, the distinction. And elsewhere, you confront this sort of surreptitious evidential strategy, which expands the notion of evidence to claim that all these cases where uh, the doxastic stage permitted by rationality change, in each case, oh, there is a change of evidence. Uh, so I think we can respond to both cases by res substituting the synchronic diachronic distinction, and actually potentially the um, Intrapersonal, interpersonal distinction. Uh, I think this might do double duty for a distinction between wide and narrow rational constraints on belief. So, a narrow constraint on belief would say that uh, only your beliefs or your mental states that bear on the truth of P affect the rationality of believing P. And a version of the wide constraint would say that uh, mental states of other kinds, so including potentially your desires, your preferences, your beliefs about the significance of P, your beliefs about other things that are evidence for the significance of P, so all these other things can affect the rationality of believing P. So uh, evidentialism or uniqueness should be equated with a narrow view, and permissivism and pragmatism will be wide views, and they'll, have, they'll be different wide views, depending on what you say are the other things that, are kind of, that, can, be, uh, that can affect the rationality of what your doctor static states. Um, but notice that accepting a wide constraint doesn't imply that you can change belief state randomly, because other things have to change, and every wide constraint will tell you what other things have to change. So it responds to the toggling objection, I think, in a kind of cleaner way. Hmm. So finally, um, I've got a small comment on the positive arguments. So I think both the um, epistemic supererogation and the doubt objection, I, I'm not going to talk about pragmatic encroachment because I've already kind of given you, given an argument for why you should have these things stronger than pragmatic encroachment. Hmm. Um, so they seem to ride on the fact that mental manipulations on one, one's evidence set can change what it's rational to believe. Uh, and you claim that this should not be construed as changes in evidence. Like, you know, 
uh, reflecting or gaining insight on your evidence set shouldn't be construed as changes in evidence. So clearly, what's rational to believe can change without one's evidence changing. Fair enough, but it seems like a bit of a straw man to require the non-permissivist to deny this. Uh, because, and it seems like there should be a plausible view that allows for the claim that mental manipulations in your evidence set can change what it's rational to believe, but deny the stronger kinds of permissivism that I think you also want to defend. Because after all, reflection or insight or becoming saliently conscious of a previously non-conscious belief do change our, the set of mental states that we have that are relevant to the truth of P. So you might not want to call that a change in evidence, but it is a change in the set of mental states that are relevant to whether or not P. So I, I think it's, 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 it's still in the style of what the uniqueness theor theorist wants to say. Certainly it's in the style of what the evidentialist wants to say. I think that I, I, I sort of equating mm -hmm. uniqueness and evidentialism. Yeah. Um, so I think the narrow wide distinction that I spelled out before um, would place the products of reasoning on insight on the narrow side, uh, and so allow the non-permissivist to accept Liz's positive arguments, but the wide constraints are still interesting because it might allow changes in one's belief about, say, significance to change what's rational to believe. And then I just have a final thought, which is I'm actually not sure that... So permissivism says, uh, given an evidence set, uh, more than one thing is permissible. And it often gives this false impression that you can believe like randomly at will, and that's what you're trying to uh, confront. So I think perhaps a better way of setting up the dynamic is not to talk about permission relevant to evidence set, but actually to say the things that determine what is required to believe go beyond evidence. So it's not to defend perm uh, being permissive, it's actually to say, no, there are, it's, it's to defend a new conception of the requirements of belief. So you're actually defending like, a view about what you must believe is determined by things that go over and above evidence. Mm -hmm. And I think that's actually the view that you have. Mm -hmm. You don't like people believing at will. You just think there are non-evidential things that determine mm -hmm. what, you, what you must believe. So I think that's just a, it's not really, a, it's a, not an objection, it's just a different way of stating the view that makes it clear why you don't like toggling and arbitrariness. Yeah. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, um, I would have given you a hand up, but then I would have had to have written this more than like earlier in the episode. So. <laughs> Sorry. Thanks so much. Uh, thanks, Max. That, that was great. Um, really helpful stuff that I think is like helping me kind of see the project in a different way. That's really helpful. Um, a lot of it I just want to like agree with. So, and also for time's sake, I am not going to talk about everything. I did want to uh, kind of re-clarify, I think, the synchronic diachronic thing. And I like the way that you put it. But basically, maybe what I want to add to the diachronic condition is that something um, beyond your evidence has to change in order to permit you changing beliefs. Um, and I think a mental state could be a t like an, an option, but I also think it could go beyond like mental states too. Like if you buy the pragmatic encroachment argument, for example, it would be like stakes. So I don't, maybe, we can talk about this. I don't know if it has to be a mental state, but I, I do. Get, I was just actually giving that an internalist version. Yeah, you could, yeah, you could have like an externalist version too. Um, yeah, so um, I wanted to talk about the possible response that a defender of uniqueness might give that basically like cool cases, but like these all involve some kind of change in evidence. Um, and I think this is a way uniqueness people can and have tried to respond to these arguments. Uh, and I think what I want to say actually sort of depends on the case, so I might not have time to cover all of it. I did want to specifically cover the like IBE case, because I think that one's maybe more compelling. So maybe you have this worry, oh, look, you get new evidence, like Jones as being the murder is the best explanation for my evidence or something. Um, so I want to offer two responses. The first is just, um, so I've talked to some of my friends who work on inference the best explanation and kind of do the more philosophy of science stuff that I don't really do and it's kind of above my pay grade. But um, from talking to them, and I've talked to some of them who are actually like really into the uniqueness thesis, and I just don't think that this is the way that a lot of people in the inference the best explanation literature are thinking about evidence. Um, my friends who like uniqueness uh, who are into this say, uh, actually just Jones's uh, initial, or sorry, your initial conclusion about Smith is just irrational. So um, I think, in the inference to the best explanation literature, there's kind of a clear demarcation between your evidence and then the hypotheses that your evidence seeks to explain. And there's, I think, controversy about what exactly like the hypotheses that are live for you counts as. 
um, but I think they're generally not taken to be part of an agent's evidence. And someone I was reading a little bit, and that if you're interested, you could look more at is John Williamson. So he has a view that which hypotheses are live for you is kind of a matter of the language that you're using. Um, and when a new hypothesis becomes live, the language changes. Um, again, don't know a ton about this literature, so uh, you can correct me in Q&A. Q but uh, I, I guess basically the, the main idea is I don't think this is the way people in the inference to best explanation literature are thinking of evidence. Um, a second kind of response, and I think this is maybe more general response that could apply to the other cases as well, is that, well, I mean, not, so one question in this literature I talked about earlier, what, what's rationality, what counts as rationality? Another question in this literature uh, that people don't talk about as much is what, what counts as evidence, right? Um, and I think uh, that's gonna determine a lot of things you're gonna say about these cases, right? But if you have a notion of evidence, for example, that's like super mentalistic, so it's just like really strongly supervenes on like, what's going on up here, right? Uh, uniqueness is gonna look more and more boring and maybe even at a certain point like trivially true because any, cha any mental change is gonna constitute an evidence change. And it's gonna be like so easy to change your evidence that uniqueness is just gonna be this kind of like, well, okay, like evidence is just like constantly changing like all the time, maybe like uniqueness is right, but it's just not, not as interesting as a thesis. So I at least think there's some pressure for defenders of uniqueness to avoid responding to counterexamples by just uh, expanding the notion of what counts as evidence or just like, you know, insisting, oh no, the agent has different evidence now. Um, at a certain point, they're gonna wanna kinda like constrain that, uh, you know, for fear of their, for uniqueness just being like truly true. Um, so I think that was the main thing um, I wanted to say about that. I guess one last thought. So there's an interesting thing, I, sorry, I'm having a lot of like meta reflections, but in the permissivism debate, people are debating about whether evidence is permissive and whether evidence underdetermines rational belief, right? But it could be that even if evidence underdetermines rational belief, rational belief is never at a time kind of underdetermined more generally, right? And so on my view, or the view I'm defending in this paper at least, evidence is never generally underdetermined by all of the facts about the agent's situation. And that's why toggling's not permitted. Um, and I think there are people in the literature that might want to defend a view that says like there are times at which uh, evidence like completely underdetermines rational belief. But one thing that's I think interesting is if you like the view I defended, I think it is going to conflict with what a lot of people take to be evidentialism. Whereas if you have the like radical underdetermination view, that might actually be consistent with evidentialism because like what you ought to believe like totally supervenes on your evidence. It's just that the evidence like doesn't fully speak to which belief you ought to have. So it's kind of interesting how like what t stand you take on synchronic versus diachronic IBP both has implications for toggling and for like what, whether permissivism is consistent with evidentialism. So anyway, cool comments, thanks. <laughs> thanks guys. <laughs> oh man. Uh, thank you. Um, I guess I agree with you at least because I accept that pragmatic encroachment, but I guess maybe okay. I don't agree with you because you don't accept that. But I'm wondering, well, yeah. <laughs> I'm wondering though, um, do you think there, there's something strange about being totally confident? Like, if I'm totally confident in, in believing some position, and then I discover that there's another rationally permissible option based on the evidence I have, uh -huh. uh, do you think I should lower my credence? Um. So, so I think it makes sense. It, so I, I'm willing to go with you this far. I think, like, uh, you, you believe one thing, I believe another. Uh, incompatible things based on the same evidence, but if like we each discover that the other one rationally believes something else based on the same evidence, it seems like we should both be a little bit less confident. Well, maybe. I mean, I guess I don't want to say definitely because I think a lot of that depends on both your views about permissivism, but also your views about like how we should respond to disagreement and whether uh, what it's like when people disagree with us, whether we ought to lower our credences. But I think I'm willing to say, like at least in some situations, maybe you don't even have to lower your credence because maybe you both have different epistemic standards, or maybe you know some of the other factors I talked about uh, are different. So I guess I think I guess what I want to say is like the mere fact that you share evidence need not always be sufficient that you ought to like lower your credence uh, when you when you find out you disagree with someone. Okay. I think I'm committed to that or something like that.
Yeah. Or maybe I don't have to be, but I am. <laughs> you're really confident in something. Yeah. It has phenomenally, you know, it feels like there wasn't any other way I could have gone if I'm confident. Yeah. But if I, if I discover that, like, oh, you have the same you evidence, but you, you went another way and you're rational, well, then there's another way I could have gone. Yeah. And so I feel like necessarily I can't be totally confident. Yeah, I mean, I'm not saying I don't see the intuition. And I think there might be cases where you should be less confident, but I also think there are cases where intuitively we just don't do this. Uh, political matters, religious matters, like debates in philosophy. I, I mean, never I have people who disagree with me have exactly, exactly the same amount of evidence. Yeah, really yeah and then this is like, what is evidence? And yeah. it comes back yeah. to a bunch of stuff we were talking about earlier. So yeah, I feel like, I mean, I'm not saying I don't feel the pull at all, yeah. but again, permissivism is an existential claim, right? Uh -huh. So I think the thought is just like sometimes at least you don't have to lower your credence, even if you. Other times you do. Okay. You're like so not convinced. <laughs> but thanks, yeah. Thank you. Amazing paper. Oh, um, thank you. <laughs> I uh, may have been given insight to change my belief. Um, so this really helps. This might be a bit of background. So I've been working on a question in social epistemology, which is basically how blameworthy should we hold people who were raised in Fox News listening in the house? Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. News. And um, I'm starting to wonder if there's a little bit of subtle slippage between the uniqueness claimed use of Fox and the idea mm. of use of determinants. And this is what I mean. So when thinking about the super irrigation stuff, and I run the argument in my head, it really matters whether I think about what's rationally required, what's rationally reasonable, what's rationally unblameworthy, and what's rationally ideal. And <laughs> so I mean, I can imagine, so what would you think of the following suggestion? Just with the super irrigation argument, maybe a body of evidence only determines one rationally ideal, uh -huh. view, but there are many different rationally reasonable yeah. or worthy views. And so in that case, your view towards uniqueness will depend a lot on whether you interpret that ought to yeah. as an ideal or a blame concept. Yeah, no good. I mean, I think this is, so I actually like submitted this paper to a journal and then got a rejection and the person was like, look, you're just like, like question begging it's the uniqueness people because they think it's like ideal rationality and you just think it's like non-ideal and like I don't know you have to like argue for your notion of rationality and so in a way I I, I see the worry and I, I I said that thing about like people being interested in this debate because they're interested in how they should respond to disagreement as like a way to hopefully help with that like if we want if we care about permissivism because we care about uh you know, something that is supposed to like apply to us as agents in like other areas of our epistemic lives. And I don't know, action guiding is like a weird word to use in epistemology and like controversial, but you know, something like that, that at least applies to us as agents or, or gives us norms. Um, you know, I don't want to say it's like the fully, I want to say that the notion of rationality at play has to not be fully idealized, but it would be interesting, but maybe also sad if we were just like talking past each other, right? Like all the permissivists are just, thinking of this like, you know, satisficing notion of rationality and then all the uniqueness people are just thinking of this ideal notion. So I think that's definitely an issue, I mean, in my paper that I want to think more about, but also like kind of in the literature in general. So, but that's helpful. You, I wrote down that whole list of things you get, you <laughs> spouted off and it's good to think about, so, it's yeah. explain why the Phil Seitz people are more uniqueness people because they may have a more ideal version. They might have a more ideal version of rationality, yeah. But it's also weird too, because some of the examples, like I think, like the paleontologist example is like a big one. Permissivists like to, and like I think, I don't know. Mike, I feel like has talked to me about this, where he's like, you tell scientists this debate, and then maybe it's like the the scientists that aren't philosophers are like all about permissivism, and then there's like these like kind of detached like ph like philosophy scientists. Well, I'm probably being such a hater right now, but but yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 the paradigm stuff. Scientists tend to believe in uniqueness. Philosophers and scientists tend to believe in permissivism. And epistemologists are uniqueness here. That's it. Uh, okay, there we go. Which one do you accept? Yeah, 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 <laughs> totally. Anyway, yeah, so. Well, your next one is going to be Oh, well, it's the same question. So my question is also on the sort of satisficing, maximizing thing. Yeah. Um, not all permissivists are satisficers, because I'm a permissivist. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> when you talked about, you sort of said, well, it's plausible that rationality is a satisficing norm, you're making permissivism far too easy. So 
So if all it takes mm. to be rational is kind of doing well enough, then of course there's going to be like wiggle room. You know, if, if, if we're in an epistemic situation where belief is rational but kind of just barely, and so being rational just means getting close enough to the kind of, you know, ideal thing, um, the, or the supererogatory thing, then of course there's going to be kind of multiple principle responses. And I thought what was interesting, even for the disagreement debate, was this idea that people who disagree with each other, there might be no fact of the matter about who's like more wrong mm -hmm. <laughs> on the basis of the evidence. There might be no fact of the matter about which one is supererogatory versus merely doing something permissible. I thought the idea was, no, these people might each be doing the ideal thing, or one of the ideal things. Mm -hmm. Um, on the basis of rationality. So, yeah. I, think, I think, I mean, okay, so part of this is just to encourage you, like, no, there really, it seems like the interesting debate is about what ideal rationality requires. Does there, is there a unique attitude that ideal rationality requires on the basis of any set of epistemic circumstances, or are there kind of multiple things that it would be ideal from the standpoint of rationality? Um, that's, that's a, yeah. a question. I, I think you, you're on this stuff about sort of primarily and, you know, once you realize the stakes, it seems like maybe you should change. That stuff's all compatible with seeing rationality as an idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, no, no. That's, yeah, that's, that's interesting. I, I, so I guess... So first of all, I think this is interesting because like I think we're both like interested in defending permissivism, but it's kind of cool how like different versions of it kind of come up like because I think you're more uh, on the interpersonal permissivism. Oh no, you're not. Oh okay, sorry, I haven't read your stuff. I shouldn't. I'm just talking to you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, let's let's talk more. Um, but yeah, so e either way, I think there is interesting um, ways of going, and you could probably yeah. Defending permissivism while maintaining like a very idealized notion of rationality, I think, is interesting. But I think it so and and you could you know that is consistent with some of the things I'm arguing. But I am worried it's not consistent with all the things I'm arguing. Um, and I do think like I I would want to hear more about the cases, like what you say about the cases, because um, for example, I think it's pretty implausible to think that. After, like, you're this juror and you've thought through this a lot and then you conclude that Smith is guilty by IBE. Um, and, like, you know, we can build in the case that you really have thought through it a lot. And um, then you get this, like, extra flash of insight. I think it's hard, it's hard for me to feel like, wow, like, you, were you, like, really irrational before you got this? Like, does rationality require you to, like, have this, like, flash of insight? But I do think we get these flashes of insight. I, I, I can kind of relate to this happening in, in, in my own experience. So one thought is just, like... I would like to hear more about what you want to say about the cases. Can I, can so, I ask you a yes, no. Are you a unique theorist about ideal rationality? No, I don't think so. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Let's talk more. Sorry, I don't think that totally answered your question, but. Sorry, I don't yeah. want to be rushing people, yeah, but sorry. we're for sure. Oh, okay. Quite a few people in the queue. So, I just, I, thanks very much for the paper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just want to follow up on that decision that, you know, by the letter of the law, you're defending permissive, but there's some, something about the spirit of your paper. Mm -hmm. right. so yeah, so that's why you can't toggle. That's why you can't toggle. Okay. okay. Yeah. <laughs> and in, the case, in the car case, um, if I did a good job of drawing your attention to the standard background possibility, mm -hmm. which is pretty good knowledge all along, and so did them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, doesn't it at some point become irrational for you to say, no, my car is there? Yeah. So, it, it, so, so that's your. I think that's what I like about my view. That's why you right. can't toggle. Okay. Like. <laughs> Uh-huh. Yeah, but it's not, but it is still, um, it's permissivist in the sense that evidence underdetermines what, what attitude you ought to take. Um, but yes, no, I, I mean, this, this, is, this is helpful to, to think about specifically with the cases, but yeah, I definitely think um, there's a weird sense in which my view... There is something that's, that's, that, that doesn't align with the spirit of permissivism, I think, in the view, because I, cause I don't say, like, once these certain things happen, you can't go back, you know? Um, like, again, there, you can't have, there's not, it's not a time when there's two attitudes that, that are live for you. 
Um, but I think that things besides your evidence, those have to change in order for what's rational for you to believe changes. So, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. I but just, just no, 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 that's helpful. That's helpful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's very quick. Yeah. It could be that your evidence underdetermines uh, what it's rational to believe, but um, not be the case that your beliefs that are relevant to whether P underdetermines what it's rational to believe, because you, think, you might think that you have beliefs, like your insights are beliefs that are relevant to whether or not P, but they're not evidence, because you don't count them as evidence. So mm -hmm. the more radical you claim is say, even things that aren't relevant to the question of whether or not P can mm -hmm. change rational to believe. So that, that, that's sort of just, I you know, pushing this thought that you know, you're not moving that far away because you mm -hmm. can say, oh, it's still determined. Yeah, they, they're, they're not evidence exactly, but it still you know, is like, relevant to whether or not P, so it's kind of evidence-like, and that determines what you're rationally required to believe. That's not moving that far away, but I think you do want to move further away. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's helpful. Thanks. Yeah, I think my comment regards uh, a few of the others that have come up. And um, so one thing that was that kind of um, stood out to me as missing is a distinction between ex post and ex ante mm. uh, uniqueness and permissivism. So this is something Luis Rosa talks about and Stuart Cohen talks about. And I wonder how you fall on, on there. So I pulled it up in the meantime, and Stu uh, Cohen defines doxastic uniqueness. So this is. Um, this is building on the propositional doxastic distinction, as you uh, or a subject can't um, believe that there are two maximally rational attitudes and pick one. So I'm wondering uh -huh. how that, um, are you on board with, with such a version, a version of uniqueness? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> right. Uh, but I think, well, a lot of the people in this debate, that would be categorized as not strictly inconsistent with permissivism, I think. Um, but yeah, I mean, yeah, so yeah, but I, I, I do think I agree with that, if that's, if that's what right, we're calling so uniqueness. You can, yeah. you can say, I'm, I'm avoiding toggling this yeah. way, right? So mm -hmm. as soon as you know that there is more than one, you have to stick with um, one of them and you have to have a reason for that. Yeah, yeah, or yeah, I guess, or, yeah. There are um, some concerns that fantastic uniqueness ultimately also leads to uniqueness. Is it, oh, okay, yeah, I would, I would be interested in hearing more about that. Um, but yeah, I think the way I'm avoiding toggling, I'm going to have to say that, I think. But I think that's also like a non-standard so non version of uniqueness. Right. But, but yeah, no, 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 that's good. I should, I should add that to my paper. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, so this is just a, a quick friendly comment, and I'm wondering if yeah. you want to take it on board or not. Sure. So um, it seems like one way to respond to these worries uh, that make evidence more mentalistic uh, in response to the kind of things that you were saying is, is just to say, look, uniqueness is supposed to hold interpersonally, uh, at least mm -hmm. in the disagreement cases. Uh, and we don't want to make the notion of evidence so like mentalistic that it, uh -huh. it very yeah, yeah, rarely yeah. holds in the interpersonal case. Right, uh, good. Or couldn't hold in the interpersonal case, that sort of thing. And I think one good result of this is that your argument uh, just easily translates into, or maybe you already have this, or maybe it's implied otherwise, but uh, into an argument for interpersonal permissivism. Because just mm -hmm. take the same case, uh, getting the flash of insight, hold the evidence fixed for two jurors, and yeah. one gets the flash and one doesn't. Totally. Um, and so now it's permissible for one and not the other, even if it's rationally required for them to believe differently. Um, so I, I'm just wondering if you want to take that sort of stuff on board. Um, but yeah. yeah, definitely. So like another way of kind of putting the worry for uniqueness in like an in Inter I always get these mixed up, interpersonal way, is like, uh, on a super mentalistic view, like, agents just never share evidence. You know what I mean? So it's like, not, I don't know, it just, like, the debate becomes, like, way less interesting, and the, the way it bears in disagreement becomes less interesting. Um, there's, like, never epistemic peers, I guess, something. So, yeah, I think I, I agree, and, and I like it. So, yes. <laughs> yeah, so I think I was going to say something very similar to what many people said about evidence, so I'll that aside and just with respect to toggling, um mm -hmm. how you about this. So I kinda like uh permissivism as well, but we sort of have this experience with philosophical views where for a little bit we think about it and we accept it and then other times we're not so sure. Um, and it seems like that's that's not like an that's not like a crazy thing to do to sort of like reflect mm -hmm. on arguments and like at one time be sort of confident and another time maybe suspend judgment. Mm -hmm. um, and I wonder if that's if that is in fact not um, Irrational, as it doesn't seem to me, uh, especially if you take a sort of non idealized conception of rationality. 
Yeah, well, why not just say that, yeah, I mean, sometimes toggling is perfectly okay, especially in yeah. those cases where your evidence isn't, like, super decisive. But, yeah. So, yeah, I don't know. I guess I thought you could sort of avoid all these problems with the toggling objection by just saying sometimes toggling is perfectly okay. Yeah. No, no, no. I actually totally agree with that and, um, you know, was trying to not commit, like, you know, not be, like, be less controversial and maybe even spot why, like, to, Maybe toggling is permissible, but here I can like explain, or sorry, impermissible, but I can explain why. Um, but I definitely am very sympathetic to the idea that, especially like from a purely like epistemic point of view, whatever, toggling's fine. But if you were like toggling, I could see like it being, like especially on certain views, maybe like abstract philosophical views, it wouldn't be that bad. But on certain views, like it could be practically bad, you know, so maybe like you could say, look, our intuitions about toggling are more because like it'd be really hard to like plan your life and like make decisions if you're like toggling between these views, uh, like you believe in God and then you don't and then like do you go to church or not or you know, whatever. But, um, but like, so our intuitions are kind of like latching onto that. But if we're just like totally isolating kind of the epistemic, then toggle away. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm sympathetic, but I don't want to like commit for the purposes of this, but yes, I am sympathetic. Hey, yeah, I, um, so a few comments about uh, rationality and truth connection. Yeah. People like to push against the um, worries. Um, so the way I understand the rationality and truth connection, it isn't like some sort of a, a claim about what doxastic agents ought to do or what the goal of belief is. So it's not like oh, one ought to believe all things that are rational to believe. But it's merely like a, a different claim, namely that um, if one believes that, if, if one is mm. rational in believing that P or if one is justified in believing that P, then one's belief that P is more likely to be true than not. Um, you know, of course, it can, with Williamson, he you know, takes that all the way and like plots it through like this. Um, so that just super quick uh, um, hmm. And then I'm yeah. also I'm a bit worried about. So I mean, you, you say that you know permissivism is an existential claim, and these permissive cases might be rare because you want to accommodate. Like, look, we can still get this justification, truth uh, connection, or rationality, truth connection. Yeah. Um, so so uh, people who who like this don't be don't be worried. But then when you look at the cases you provide, they seem very rudimentary. And it seems like, you know, many of these sorts of mm, things can good. happen. So it seems yeah. sort of to like undermine like, hey, we can we can accommodate like, in these cases, um, especially of the, the cases of like the similar like, like, super irrigation, like, yeah. and Edward that you mentioned, like those happen that those can happen all the time, you know. Right. And especially with like, uh, priming and salience too. So mm -hmm. just no, 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 that, that's good. I, the second thing, I just, I agree. Yeah, I need to, especially because I was like, oh, yeah, we reason by IB all the time, and, you yeah, know. Yeah yeah. yeah, yeah, so, no, totally. Um, I do think with the first comment, so, like, uh, I just, like, it depends, I mean, again, it depends on, like, your notion of rationality, and, like, Williamson has this, like, fact of notion and whatever, sure. but I do think, like, misleading evidence is, like, a thing, <laughs> and it's, like, definitely, so, even that rationality requires the propositions being more likely true than not, well, maybe on your evidence or something, but like, yeah, like again, maybe the notion of likely we need to clarify. But I do think I, I want the notion of rationality at play to like respect this idea that sometimes evidence is radically misleading. So, yeah, but thanks, those are helpful. Yeah, yeah. And just a uh, last final question. Um, so are you using like rationality? So it, um, would you agree with this? As his belief that P is rational, it's an only as as his belief that P is doctrinally justified. Are you using those? Is it, yeah, are yeah. you putting um, uh, the rationality of our beliefs within doxastically justified purposes? I think so. Or, okay, yeah, because yeah. it seems like it's curious, like, what is the target here exactly? Uh huh. Yeah, I mean, and like people distinguish between justification and rationality, yeah, and sometimes yeah. I think in most of my papers I'm just like I'll just use the words interchangeably. Okay, yeah. <laughs> but like I also I don't know there might be some fruitful distinction there that I'm like ignoring, so I want to be open to that. But I usually yeah. just say like I use them interchangeably, so <laughs> but yeah, no, 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 that's that's helpful. Oh yeah, um, so just touching on the, the last thing you guys were talking about, and a couple other people talked about yeah. two theses. One thesis is that all rational. Mm -hmm. Another one is that any state that's rationally permitted is also rationally required. 
Can you say the second one again? Sorry. The second one is all permissions are requirements. Oh. Anything that's permitted is required. And you want to think that at any given time, mm. only one thing is rationally permitted to an agent. This is helpful. It's just that that supervenes on something other than what the agent's evidence is. Uh huh. Uh -huh. you could also have a view, a sort of weak evidentialist view, that's like all the rational permissions and requirements supervene on evidence. But sometimes there might be more than one thing that's permitted. Uh huh. Uh huh. Um, yep. I think I actually want to deny both those theses. Mm -hmm. I mean, one reason to deny this sort of Permissions requirements, all permissions are requirements, is you might think that sort of what you rationally have to draw from your evidence depends on a lot of things, including, as some people have suggested, your evidential standards. And you might think that your evidential standards kind of grow and develop over time, and they kind of extend hmm. further. Interesting. In yeah, which yeah, case, yeah. there are going to be points at which your evidential standards don't yet tell you what to do with the evidence you've got, and you've got to kind of work out which way your evidential standards are going to go. And there might be multiple ways that would be permitted. And yeah. And that's a very different kind of case than the kind of case that you're talking about. But that would be a case where you literally have multiple attitudes that are permitted to you at that moment, given all the facts, both evidential and what you're aware of and the insights you've had and all that. Yeah. Right. So that would be a very different kind of case than the way Yeah, no, 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 that's good. I think when I was answering earlier questions, it was like kind of like for the purpose of this paper, like I definitely want to like did not, or sorry, be committed to the second thing you were saying, all permissions are requirements. But I think, like, overall, when I'm just, like, reflecting on my views in general, I think there's actually some really interesting arguments against that. Um, Blake Raber, I don't know if you know him, but he's, like, a Notre Dame uh, guy. He has also this view where it's, like, you're slowly gaining evidence that makes you go from withholding to believing, but it's kind of like a sororities thing. And then, like, that's also kind of motivating this idea that you could be in a case where two doc fast attitudes are like live for you. So um, I think probably like with my own personal views, I deny too. But I also, yes, agree that, that I, I like the way that you just put that because I think that's a good way of saying kind of what I'm committing to in this paper. So that's, a, that's helpful. Unfortunately, we are out of time. So okay. let's thank you guys so much. <laughs>